without further ado, I'd like to introduce Laura Munson, author of tonight's focus, Willow's Grove. She will be in conversation tonight with Deborah Goodrich Royce, author of Finding Mrs. Ford in her upcoming publication, Ruby Falls. So let me actually open this up because we just got a brand new bio just recent. So give me one second as I pull this up. Technical difficulties already, as we know with Zoom. Oh no, it's not coming. All right. I am so sorry, Laura. I'm going to go with the original one. Um, please, after I do these introductions, add whatever you'd like. I know we have all night to talk. So, Laura is a writer in all definitions of the word. She has written for herself, for literary journals you've never likely never heard of, and for newspapers and magazines that you know well. Laura's work into is inspire others through her words. She does throw to speaking across the country, teaching at her Haven writing retreats and programs in Montana, and lives it every day when she faces the blank page. Her mission is to hold people in a safe, nurturing, and inspiring way as they move into the wilderness of writing and living. Now about Deborah Goodrich Royce. Deborah was an actress in film and television for 10 years. Her big break came in the leading role of Silver Kane on the long running ABC soap opera, All My Children. Deborah went on to star in feature films. After the birth of her daughters, Deborah moved to Paris in 1992 and worked as a reader for Lay Studio Canal, uh, Canal Plus. On her return to the US, she transitioned to Miramax Films and their story editor. In 2004, Deborah and her husband, Chuck Royce, small cap investment pioneer, restored and opened the Avon Theater Film Center in 1939. Deborah Goodrich Royce's first psychological thriller, Finding Mrs. Ford, published in 2019 to rave reviews. Her second, Ruby Falls, will come out May 4th, 2021. Laura and Deborah will speak now, so please welcome our authors now. Come on in. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you so much. Thank you. Last minute adjustments. Ah. So if you'd it's like all good. to introduce yourselves, that was a lot of tech difficulties for those just coming in now. It's okay. It's all good. Hi, Laura. Hi, Kaylee. I'm going to oh, leave now and let you do okay. anything. Please enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you. So Laura, I am so happy to be here with you. I, I really, I've spent the past couple of months immersed in both of your books, your memoir and your novel. And I feel like, I, you know, I'm just greeting an old friend, even though we've never physically met in person. So hi, good to hi. see you. It's great to see you. Um, I have to tell you, I'm a little starstruck because I was an all my children aficionado. My grandmother used to send me what's happening in the soaps when I was at camp, when I was a kid, when I went to prep school, when I went to college and I can feel her go, go. She is just laughing from her grave right now or the great beyond that I am talking with Silver, Erica Kane's sister, but I know you're a whole lot oh, more than that, but man, that makes that me very happy. Big part of our childhood. <laughs> Makes me very happy. Yes, soaps are an interesting world that is virtually gone. Well, there are three soap operas left, but let's not talk about me that much. I want to, so I'm going to say you begin Willis Grove, which I, I have here in my hands with the most wonderful Joseph Campbell quotation. You say, we must be willing to get rid of the life we've planned so as to have the life that is waiting for us. And to me, that so perfectly tees up your book. It so perfectly describes our lives. And I think we should start there and give you a minute to read a little bit or however you want to begin. And then we'll, we'll chit chat. Let's do it. Okay. okay. So essentially I'm going to read a, a couple excerpts from um, this very well-worn advanced reading copy and um, but before I do so for those of you who don't know what Willis Grove is about I'll just give you a quick little setup so this is this is a novel um, and on the other side of this wall I'm in my dining room right now on the other side of this wall is my office and in that office is a closet with about 24 22 to 24 I lost count count unpublished novels. Some of them are good, but not all of them. Then most of them were exercises in learning. And so while I was known for memoir uh, from This Is Not The Story You Think It Is, the novel is my true love. And so to be able to write a book that I hope captures what happens when people leave their regular daily lives to go someplace far away and 
as the poet Emma Mellon says, spell yourself differently. And I watch it over and over again on my Haven writing retreat. So this book is not about a writing retreat, but it is about people who are in major crossroads moments in their lives who are isolating. And I think that, I mean, like that describes all of us right now in so many ways. So never when I wrote the book could I have imagined how timely it would be. So the book is really about four women who have been in isolation, all at major crossroads moments, very relatable ones at that, coming together, leaving home so that they can tell their stories and then more authentically and powerfully bridge back to their daily communities. And so, so I want to begin with um, the, what's at the end of the book. Uh, which is a, a letter to the reader. And it really perfectly describes what this, like the impetus behind this book is and why I think it's so relevant now. So one of the characters in the book uh, says, you know, we're fluent, we're all fluent in this language, in the language of community. And yet we so rarely speak it. It really is our mother tongue. I'm going to read that one more time. You know, we're all fluent in this language, in the language of community, and yet we so rarely speak it. It really is our mother tongue. And that's what this book is about. It's about people telling their stories. So here we go. Dear reader, I have learned something that might just be the most important lesson of my life, and I would like to share it with you. There is a language that we crave a language of the heart that grows from our worry and our wonder and our stories rooted in our experience of this beautiful and heartbreaking thing called life. Too many of us have trained ourselves out of speaking that language. We were all fluent in it when we were children, but somewhere along the way we were taught or conditioned to forget it, to not be honest when we are asked, how are you? and to not really listen to the answer when we ask others the same question. So many of us have lost our authentic voices and reduced our conversations to grocery store talk and texts with an emoji at the end. The truth is we long to be seen and heard and accepted, especially when we are in pain. Yet out of fear of judgment or rejection, we too often draw in and become islands rather than bridging to our family and friends. I know this because at times I've made that choice and the fallout from that led me to devote a major piece of my life to bringing people together in safe, intimate circles of self-expression which led me to write this book. I wrote Willis Grove to capture the power of people stepping out of the isolation and self-doubt that so many of us feel in times of transition and instead gathering together, which we all miss so much right now. These women show us that we don't have to endure hardship alone, nor should we, we have choices. If for whatever reason, connecting with our usual community is too fraught, we can instead create temporary circles, friend to friend to friend to friend, carving out small interludes from our daily lives in order to focus on what comes next. To have those conversations we need to be having and aren't. To move boldly outside of gossip, small talk and pretending and into the connection we so deeply need. I hope that in reading this book and in the spirit of Willa, Bliss, Harriet, and Jane, you will be inspired to reach out to your own dear friends, whether close by or far away. And in radical, oh, hang on a second, I skipped a line, and that you will invite them to come together for short respites to support one another, in the powerful way that people can when they give themselves permission to say yes to the profound invitations of their lives. My mission is this, we will start a movement of week-long interludes from the stresses and pain of our crossroads moments and in radical and real communication. We will provide ourselves and our kindreds with a map for our next steps. Our voices deserve to be honored and heard. No one has your voice, no one. However we speak, 
now is the time for truth. And yes, we don't have to do it alone. So that's the letter to the reader at the end. And I'm just going to read you the invitation. And then Deborah and I are going to get into some conversation, which I'm so looking forward to, Deborah. So this is very quick. This is the beginning of the book. It begins with the women. On a typical day in their typical lives, three women went to their mailboxes and found amid junk mail and bills and shiny flyers for unshiny things, an invitation sealed with a bold W pressed into sage green wax. They had been waiting for this invitation. They longed for it as much as they feared it because to break the seal was to release a behemoth of a question, a question so impossible that they had almost stopped asking it. Each hesitated, looked around and in respective order thought, sweet Jesus, what the hell? Here goes nothing and slid her finger under the seal, revealing a thick handmade note card pressed with silvery leaves. Words winked up at them, words that might, if given the chance, change everything. They swallowed and pulled out the card. Inside, nestled with a wild bird feather were the following words. You are invited to the rest of your life. You know you can't go on like this, not for one more day. You need an interlude. Imagine this, you're in a farmhouse in Montana, wrapped in a soft blanket, sitting by a warm wood stove. There's a cup of tea in your hand, just the way you like it. There are women surrounding you who need this just as badly as you do. We all have the same question. The question is, so now what? Come to Montana and find out. Love, Willa. You don't have to do this alone. Each woman held the invitation to her heart, drew in a deep breath before letting out an exhausted sigh that echoed from Connecticut to Wisconsin to California and back to Montana and went inside to call a dear friend. So that's how the book begins. Shall we start the conversation, Deborah? I can also I read would, other stuff. I would love to start the conversation. So these characters, Willa, Bliss, Harriet, and Jane. Willa is the inviter. It is Willa's Grove in Montana. That's where everyone's going. I, I'm very intrigued. What I always love to know from a writer, and I, I know what I think, I would ask you, who are you among these women? Why did you pick four? Do they represent different aspects of yourself? How did you coalesce this group of four women to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish in their time together? Love that question, thank you. Um, the, so the draft of Willis Grove that's on the bookshelves now, recently out in paperback, um, is the 19th draft. And anybody out there who writes a novel understands that it takes a long time. So this book took me like about eight years to write. And the first time I wrote it, the first draft, um, I, I, I banged the whole thing out because I really wanted to capture what happens on a writing retreat. What happens, I mean, over and over and over again, people come out here to Montana to do Haven writing retreats and they say, we're your best group, right? Like it could never be this good again. And I have to break them the news that it just is. It always is over and over and over again. So I wanted to figure out what's the magic of this. So the first draft of this was highly prescriptive. All the characters were ready to go. They were so excited. And then after I finished writing it, I realized that it wasn't any good. <laughs> and so I had to really get to know the characters. And fiction writers know, as you know well, that the characters, sometimes the plot leads the book, uh, often the characters read, uh, lead the book. So I had to get clear about the characters. So, so I always say that none of these characters is me, none is anyone I know, and they are all of us. So the way that I was able to 
I believe create the book that that it is now was by going into their conflicts and creating and imagining very relatable ones. So let's just break them down quickly. So Willa's uh, conflict is the Emersonian um, dream of self-reliance. So her conflict is self-reliance versus interdependence. Then bliss is, is something that I think a lot of people feel inside, but don't talk about. And that is faith versus religion, faith versus religion. And then Harriet's is one that I know well, and that is addiction to ambition. Maybe you can relate. I can relate well to this. And then the fourth one is Jane and Jane, Jane's is something that a lot of people need to know that money doesn't bring you happiness. Uh, neither does social prestige. It brings you choices and it brings you comfort, but not necessarily happiness. So I went for the subjects and, and conflicts that I thought would help people. And, and, and they went deeply into them by storytelling. So that's, that's how I came up with the characters and how they, and how I eventually let them tell the story. And once I did so, that's when the whole thing I mean, I can see this town, I can see the characters, I can see the place, and no, none of it is anything I've ever seen in real life, really. I made it all up. And Montana is a big character in the story. And that one I didn't make up. <laughs> that brings me, I'm going to jump a little bit just based on what you said. I think you have done one of my favorite things in a book you have created a place that is so vivid that the place is very much a character, a living presence in the story. And the story wouldn't be what it is in a different place. So is it a completely fictitious place? It is, in my mind it is. It's so so to, for those of you who, have, who haven't read the book, um, it's a town called Willa, Montana. Uh, population 34, I believe. Um, it's, it's, it's in my mind, so here's the state of Montana. We're way over here in the Northwest corner near Glacier National Park. It's more in the center between Helena and Great Falls. And I haven't spent a lot of time there. So I did, I did a bunch of research to make sure I got the flora and fauna right and um, the, the weather and, and, and all of that. But uh, it's very much made up in, in my mind because I felt like I needed the retreat too. I needed to get out of the place where I know um, and let it come alive. And, you know, that's one of my favorite comments that I'm getting over and over from people. It's just, especially now with the pandemic, you know, everybody wants to come to Montana and it, it's, um, this place works in you. I've lived here for 30 years. I grew up in Chicago. I spent a lot of time in the East Coast. I lived in Seattle, but this place has worked in me and it serves up a whopping, a whopping dose of inspiration and challenge every day. And really Montana is my muse. So this place, I made it up, but I, I also know that there, uh, all across the United States and I'm sure other places too, these teeny little towns, um, people cling to them because it has a lot to do with identity. And originally the town that I created was a family homestead, a square mile of land that then the descendant of the original homesteader decided like we need to bring in the disenfranchised, the people who are living in, in rural uh, situations and they need community like we all <laughs> need right now. And so he and his wife, Willa, brought people together and that's and that's what is so the like the subplot of the book so yes it's about these four women but it's also about this town and how the women come together to create their own community and then how that begets the community coming together i won't give away the end so you use the word challenge <clears throat> which I think most of us would agree that it is the crisis that catapults us into the change that very few of us would just wake up one fine and perfect day with no crisis and say, I think I'm going to change it all up. So can you talk a little bit about your own life and that kind of what <laughs> like our kids would say a trigger event, but maybe that's too minor one of those seismic events that changes everything which then leads to you 
doing whatever you're going to do next? Uh, I can just point to it. It's this one. <laughs> This was pretty seismic. So this is a this is not the story you think it is, which uh, was a memoir that came out ten years ago, um, and it the, the short version of it went really crazy viral in the Modern Love column. And the the name of that essay was "These are not those are not fighting words, dear." And um, I never ever thought I would write a memoir. I love personal essay, but a memoir. So I think maybe you understand this too. It's like. I say writing is my practice, my prayer, my meditation, my way of life, and sometimes my way to life. And that's that's what this one was. This was me writing my way through a very difficult time in my life. And the entry point was a marital crisis. Now that said, the book is really true to its title, not about a marital crisis. It's about a woman becoming aware, a person becoming aware of how her thought patterns serve her and how they sabotage her. And that's really what that book is about. It's about mind awareness. Now, a lot of people read it like a marital thriller and it really, that's not really what it was about. So, so that, that's, so now let's, let's shift to the genre of fiction. I believe that fiction is distilled reality. You know, it's realer than real. So you can bet that writers mine their lives whatever genre they're writing and whether they're creating characters that sprout wings and fly out the window, you know, we're all still mining the human reality. So I hope that answers the question. It does. I think I've always felt that, you know, the, the way I can write truth is through fiction. But you, so you set these women, each one has this life crisis, this turning point. All of these crises are different. And when they come together, they there's friction. And what I'm most interested in in Willa is this ambivalence. She seems to have to me in, in hosting this retreat. She hosts it, but she doesn't seem very enthusiastic about it. And she has to be pulled kicking and screaming into her own transformation as well. And I, I was very... It, it that's felt more real to me than if she had just already arrived. Well, so yeah, so exactly. And that's when, remember when I said like, I wrote the first version and it was so prescriptive and then I had to break it all down. And I thought, How, what is it that we need? And, and it's the telling of our stories, especially now we need to tell our stories. And so, I, I, I let the, again, let the characters figure out how to, how to do so. And what they decided to do was to break down their stories, even, and especially when they resisted the telling of them into different parts. And one was, what was supposed to happen? Like, what did you think would happen? What was your dream? Because if they're going to come on a retreat like that, something tells me that what they thought would happen didn't actually happen, right? And that's why they're isolating in that way. And then the next part is what actually happened. So what was supposed to happen and then what actually happened. And then that opens the gates for the group coming together to help each other figure out what's next. And and another thing that I, I really experienced once I let those characters tell the story was that a lot of them didn't want to tell the story. A lot of them didn't trust groups. A lot of them didn't trust uh, women or such an isolating kind of like, or, or some, it's not isolating, but like a small group scenario. And that it takes a lot for a lot of us to speak to our truth and tell our stories. And we need to tell our stories. We absolutely need to. And I'll end this here. We have to make space for the telling of them. We have to make space for the, the telling of them. In ways that aren't social media. Uh... Yeah, 13 characters. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about birds. There are so many birds and bird events and and bird symbolism and in this book i'm very intrigued by that will you talk a little bit about it i would love to talk about that and that it's sort of this is sort of a 
industry insider comment, but I think it's fun. And like, whenever I hear authors speak, and especially when I was younger and I would go to Elliott Bay Book Company in Seattle and, you know, I'd sit in the front row and be like, Isabel Allende, like, do you drink coffee or tea? <laughs> you know, it's like pajamas or do you get dressed? Like, I just love writer process questions. And um, so it, 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 there were some editors, some early beta readers of mine before I submitted it to my dear and amazing agent, Beth Davey. Um, and they said, there are too many birds in this story. And I said, oh, goody, I'm going to write more about birds because, <laughs> and that's the author's prerogative. Now, whether that gets you published or not, I say, follow your truth. And I just wrote more birds into it because the whole book is, right, the trajectory you can already tell is about migration. It's about these people leaving their, their comfort zones, one in Connecticut, one in Wisconsin, one in California, and coming to Montana, which is a place that many people haven't visited before, much less, you know, sat in with people telling their stories and all of the new things that might happen, like grizzly bears and gorgeous flora and fauna, and I, I don't want to give things away. Um, and so I think that once these women come together, then the whole thing starts to unfold. And part of the way that that unfolds is about the theme of migration. And when we stop, which we've all been asked to this year, we start to look up. We start to notice the birds. The birds can teach us a lot. Now, if you live in a Southern climb, well, no, and no matter where you live, birds are coming and going all the time. And I have learned so much from them. So I think that the, I, so it's twofold to, to answer your question. One is birds are a huge part of why I live here because it goes so dormant in the winter. And then when they come back and they're, they're back now, like right now I'm sitting in my dining room, they're robins uh, that are back, you know, and it's just been so quiet all winter and I'm so grateful for them. I can hear the, the woodpeckers, they're, they're all doing their songs, which, you know, they're trying to figure out their nests. The male robins come back first. And when, when you see robins and you see robins almost everywhere, notice how they hop, 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 like five steps and then they stop and then they get a worm do you know that it's because they're listening for worms they oh. can hear the worm in the ground and then the other thing I love so much and this this uh, bird takes a uh, part in the book a calliope hummingbird it's the smallest bird in all of the bird world and um it migrates alone this little teeny thing it's no bigger than if you're on the east coast it's no bigger than a june bug and it migrates alone all the way from up here in Montana to Costa Rica and back. How could you not learn from the birds? So I think a lot of, I guess, really what I wanna say is that, that, that if you are somebody who's going to pay attention to birds, it means you need to stop and you need to look up and down and notice. And that's what people do on a retreat. Well said. So there's something from uh, the audience, Alison Scherer, that I'd like to delve into. She says, this is not an exact quotation, but more of a paraphrasing. Sometimes you just have to let yourself be misunderstood. And she asks the question, how do you make peace with that? And I'd like to say a little bit about that. You know, it's when you are a writer, you are putting yourself out every day to be, you hope understood, but sometimes you are misunderstood. And we do have to make peace with that. We do have to, you said something about, you know, writing your truth, or writing the book that it needs to be, and then whether it's understood or misunderstood, it's part and parcel of it. So how do you make peace with that? Oh, man. I mean, Deborah, you know this as an actress and an author. It's, um, I always tell people that we, that's why I lead retreats, right? Because we have to write past the fear of exposure, whether we're writing memoir or fiction or short stories or what, you know, whatever it is, poetry, cookbooks, we're still exposing ourselves. And I tell writers, nobody asks us to do this. 
right? And so that's why we have to really understand the bridge to ourselves before we can build the bridge to our books. And then ultimately it's the book that builds the bridge to the reader. So allowing yourself to be misunderstood, it's not like we're just like walking out on the street naked and doing performance art. I don't have the courage to do that, but I've sat in the intersection of heart and mind and craft that is the writing life since 1988. And, you know, again, I've got a bunch of books on the other side of this wall that aren't so great, but some of them are. And I think that that's why we have to get our finger on the pulse of why we write or express ourselves in any way in the first place. And I know there are a lot of people here who aren't writers, but you can, you can apply that philosophy to any sort, sort of self-expression. And I'm working on a book right now about creative self-expression, whether it's the spoken word or you, you, the written word, but also just your thoughts in the, in the first place. And, and if you're going to expect, I mean, think about Thanksgiving. If you're gonna, <laughs> just think about Thanksgiving. Yeah, Thanksgiving. Right? You're just sitting at a table. You promised that you were not going to bring up this one thing and it comes flying out of your mouth. And there we go. And everybody's 16 again. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I, I do think that, that if we value what it is that we have to say, we can find a container for it and a platform from which to express it. And I, for some people that's important. It is for me, it is for you. For some people it's not, and that's okay. Well, I have a funny little personal story about something like that. I was having a, a very deep conversation with a, a loved one, I will just say, about something. She was saying to me, I just want to explain this to you, and I just want to explain this to you. And I said, you know, I really have heard you and I do hear what you're saying. I may not agree with you about how that situation was, but I hear you and I love you. And that's, I think writing is a little bit like that. You know, you, you say what you want to say and there is gonna be that person who might not quite agree with you, but if you can come to that place where you're both at peace with it, but at Thanksgiving, it doesn't always happen. That's a no. fact. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't usually. So there's another reader here uh, who's asking about the concept of trust. Uh, she says, I'm so excited to see, and I can't see what her name is, how the idea of trust plays out in Willis Grove with the authentic voice I know you write about. So this is someone who knows you. So you want to talk a little bit about uh, the idea of trust and the authentic voice. Yes. And thank you, whoever wrote that. That's a, that, It's important, right? So to create the space for people to tell their stories um, is something that's very important. And that's when I read uh, the letter to the reader, that's what I'm trying to set up. That it's not just that you go up to somebody in the grocery store and, you know, buying broccoli and tell them your life story. Um, it's, it's, and Deborah, I do, there's a line from your book that I want to get to before we end. That's about our stories. Um, so, uh, we have to find a safe place to do so. And I just get to watch it. You know, I've worked with over a thousand people at Haven Writing Retreats in Montana. I have like six different programs, five. I don't know. Right now I've got like, who knows? It's a lot of online stuff. But I just, like we had one woman who said that the first night, she said, this is the best family reunion I've never been on. <laughs> And that just cracked me up because I think when people are so intentional about leaving home for, for the express reason to figure out whatever it is that they want to express, whether you go on a yoga retreat or writing retreat or whatever mindfulness retreat, a writing retreat to me is all of the above. And I do offer yoga. So that's how I can say it. But there is that, that element of trust and, and fear, right? Because it's not... If you're me, and I don't know about you, Deborah, but if somebody stops me in the grocery store and says, how are you? Well, do you have 15 minutes? Because I'm going to answer it. 
not right now. Cause you know, I haven't been to the big grocery store in a year, but um, you know, back a year ago, I'm that person. Like um, my mother, <laughs> what's the tea called? Constant comment. Constant comment. My mother says that tea was named after me. <laughs> so <laughs> I have no fear of, of creative self-expression. And yet that's funny that after this last year, I was talking to a friend today. I was saying, I, I kind of need to like test my social IQ because I'm not sure that I know how to be out in the world. And is it because of trust? Uh, I think it's more about trusting myself. I mean, that's a different subject, but don't you all feel that way too? It's just like, okay, we've just been so, so in our little world for the last year. Now to take that on the road, I, I mean, the pandemic's not over, but I don't know if I, I don't know if I can do it. So I, I'm wondering if I can trust myself, but the one place here, I'll end it here. The one place I can trust myself is on the page. And I've trusted myself on that page since I've been a little girl, uh, again, in that closet behind um, this wall it, uh, are all my journals going back to a little pink patent leather journal that says private on it. And it's mostly about boys. <laughs> well, as it would be. So that idea of the journal and the private person and the public person, I write thrillers and my deepest interest is identity. And I look at identity in through a prism of who people tell you they are and who they don't tell you they are. So it's extreme in my books because they're thrillers. You know, there's always a twist or a shock there. But I think you're writing a very similar thing. You're writing about women who present in a particular way. You know, there's the front and there's the back. And I think it's all about trusting yourself as you're saying, or how do you go out? By the way, you're doing very well out on the Zoom road here, presenting yourself. But I, I mean, I just find it the most interesting thing in the world, this question of who people really are. I always find they're not exactly who they say they are. Yeah, I'm gonna interrupt you and add, okay, so th these are my notes on Deborah's book. Oh, okay. Ruby Falls. And it's exactly what you're saying because I write, this is why I never loan out my books because I just write all over them. And there's a line in Deborah's book and she says, she, she writes, I have always felt that everything was my fault ever since my father left me. But how did I end up with a husband who reinforces that belief? And my note, well, I wrote conflict and then I wrote the story she's in. And then I wrote in Willis Grove, they come together to tell their stories. And then, and I, and then I wrote Ellie, who's the protagonist um, is strong because she overcomes her childhood myth of shame and guilt and closes the case on that narrative. And then I wrote, sometimes our stories are true but often they're myths. And in Willis Grove, there, I, when I read, I, when I read that, I just kind of had a power freak out as a, a editor and writer and friend of Deborah and everything. I just, so Ellie says, so here's my note. I think that Ellie and my four characters are similar in that they are living a life that is run by a story that is no longer true or never was true in the first place. And that story is what propels the choices we make in life that aren't always good ones. Again, in Ellie's case, to me, it's illuminated in this line. I've always felt that everything was my fault ever since my father left me, but how did I end up with a husband who reinforces that belief? Now, in Willa's case, to me, the same the same note, and I think that's what you're, you're, you're touching on here, Deborah. Uh, Willa says, I'm a firm believer in storytelling, said Willa. Our stories change, you know? And I think we forget that. I think we lock into a certain time in our lives and memorize it and live by it. But when we tell our stories out loud, we can hear what's true. And the whole time I was reading that in your book, I was thinking, 
Ellie needs to come to Montana. And do Ellie it. would have benefited very much. You've made me think about something we do if, if anybody here is a parent. And even if we don't mean to do this, we do this with our children. I remember when my older daughter went away to boarding school and my older daughter, uh, she's graceful and elegant and she's a ballerina and all these things. And my younger daughter was a little more rough and tumble. And at some point after the eldest went to boarding school, someone said to me about the youngest, oh, she's so graceful. And do you know, for a moment, I almost said, oh, no, 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 she's not the and I heard this thought coming out of my mind and we do it to others, we do it to ourselves. So you have these women in a setting where they're kind of deconstructing all of that. They're peeling it apart. That automatic, no, 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 I'm not that one. And, and I love that aspect of the book. Good, because I was really worried about that aspect of the book, right? Like, how do you get, it's, you know, 350 page book or whatever it is. How do you get people telling their story to have narrative drive, narrative movement? How do you do right. that? And I think that's another reason why it took me a long time to get it right. And I'm really happy with how it is. Um, it's because there is movement in storytelling and part of the movement is the push-pull, the clash, that I don't want to, to tell my story. I don't feel like I can trust. I am afraid of being misunderstood. How do we create a place where you could actually tell your story? And then how do we break it down into a way that would work? What was supposed to happen, what actually happened, and then help each other move forward into the next chapter of our lives. That's a very, um, I don't know, that's scary for a lot of people. And also because Willis Grove is not moderated by a facilitator, like when I lead my writing groups, right? So they have to figure out how to make their own rules. So, and I think those rules, uh, creating those rules apply to, um, well, Thanksgiving dinner or a family reunion or talking with our children or speaking with a colleague. Um, or, and so much of it now is staring into screens. How do we create that sacred place for connection and community? And, you know, part of me just wants to go down to the river and wash clothes with other women or men, or, I mean, I, <laughs> I, 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 I think this year has brought us all into a really primal place of what is self-expression and how do we need to create a community around it and many of us don't know how to. And so we're even more alone than we ever have been. And um, yet, I think this year in the slowing down and in these crazy virtual connections, I have found that even though we're not physically together, there I have found very deep connections going on. I mean, I find myself wondering, and I'd love to ask you this question, what will you keep out of this pandemic? What would you like to keep? What has changed in your life for the better that you, you don't want to go back to the old, you know, rat race or whatever? <laughs> Anything? Well, I, you know, I've lived in Montana for 30 years, so I like the rat race. Like, you know, I, I, I leave here almost every single month and have for 30 years. Uh, it's easy. Well, I shouldn't like promote Montana as a place to move. But for me, it's easy enough to I can be in midtown Manhattan by 2.30 Eastern Saturn time. Um, I just have to get on one of those god awful five o'clock in the morning flights. Um, I have not been on an airplane in one year. And I, I OK. I'm sure all of us have now seen the octopus, my teacher or whatever it is, my teacher, the octopus on Netflix. And if you haven't really, everybody should watch it. And what I love is that he just dives the same sea kelp 
forest over and over and over again. I feel like I've been diving the same sea kelp forest over and over and over again that is my 20 acres in Montana. And then all the abutting uh, beautiful trails, Whitefish Trail, Whitefish has a really beautiful trail system. And um, and I just feel like, uh, like it's just, okay, I, 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 this is not what you probably thought I would answer with, but like, you know, that dead fly on your windowsill, yeah. it's, it's going to be there tomorrow unless you clean it off or somebody else does. And the somebody else's of my life aren't there to clean it off. So I wake up, I come down, I make my tea, Jasmine green. This is always my Jasmine green or Earl gray. Love the Earl having a love affair with the Earl always. And I look at that dead fly and I think I need to clean that off. But it also reminds me that I'm alive. That's sort of scary. The other thing is that like, remember my dinner with Andre? Yes. Like I loved that one line from my dinner with Andre when Wallace Shawn says, okay, good Andre, uh, Gregory. Like you went to the, you know, the, the mountain and then you were buried, buried alive. And then Wallace Shawn says, but can't I just get the same thing in a cigar shop on Fifth Avenue? And that's kind of how I feel like this whole year has been. It's just like a cigar shop on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> You're, you're in the, <laughs> that version. So we have a question from Allison Shara again. She asks you, how do you create community across social class differences in Willis Grove between Willa and the other residents of Willa, Montana? I'm looking at that too. Hi, Allison, by the way. Um, how do you create community across social class differences? So that, that's an interesting question. So. Um, Wow, that's a big one. So my book is about four white women. Um, and demographically speaking, they are very diverse. I didn't, I, I had two women of color on a retreat. And I said, should I have women of color in the book? Like, I mean, I don't, and they're like, please, no. Don't do that. And Terry McMillan, actually, she, you know, she and I did a podcast together. Um, you know, remember uh, when Stella gets her groove back, and um, and then it, it, she was featured in Time Magazine, and then she featured Willis Grove. Like I, to me, this book is not about color or race or anything. It's about conversation, and in that very diverse conversation. And I, I, I guess the. Like, remember where I started with this whole thing when I said it's about learning about the conflict and diving into the conflict? To me, I'm trying to find conflicts that are not um, demographically specific, but something that we all experience, like, again, like faith versus religion, um, uh, addiction to ambition, um, you know, self-reliance versus interdependence. Um, What's my relationship with money? You know, is it is it money brings you happiness or not? And if we can go deeply into the story of it and find a place to tell it that's safe, then I think a lot opens up in that way. And Allison, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's at least a good place to start. How do you create community across social class differences? And I think if you begin, I know how I'm gonna answer this. Instead of thinking about the problem, let's go into the humanity and let's begin there. And so let's sit in a room together, which is what we're doing right now with tea or, you know, I mean, coffee, I'm a big tea person, but, and just be like, what's life like for you right now? And let's have it be safe. And to start communicating and telling our stories, especially in the way they do it in Willis Grove, to me is where all the magic begins because we're not, there's no social jockeying. There's nowhere to get. There's no. There's nobody to impress. And that's why I want to start this movement, right? Friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. Like I know you're in pain. I'm in pain. I'm going to reach out to you. Do you know anybody in pain? Yes, I do. I'll reach out to her. Uh, you know, it's like the Fabergé ad from the '70s. And then suddenly you've got four people coming together telling their stories. And to me, the storytelling is where everything begins. So 
talk to us about your movement. I want to hear a little bit more about you. You do say you'd like to start a movement. Yeah, I want, I want, I want it to be like, so this is, will. so, okay. So a grove of aspens is one organism. And I did not know that until I moved here. So the mother aspen grows and then she creates this underlying soil and root system that creates all these saplings and those then become a grove and it's one organism and a lot of people don't know that and that's and there's a scene in the book where willa explains this to i think it's to harriet one of the characters mm -hmm. and so that's what i want i want this interconnection of grove whatever that means so my hope is that it would be like deborah's grove allison's grove kaylee's grove whatever it is and so of course i thought of this in the last eight years and then the pandemic hit but i think more than ever this is what we need to do so i want people to read that letter to the reader read the book of course and then create your own grove so uh let's say it's deborah's grove so deborah invites one friend which invites, who invites one friend, who then invites one friend, who invites one friend, like in the book. That's so this, this chain of friends, not all being primary friends with the central person. That's right. That and was I, interesting. And I think you can do it at home too, but I think it's better. I think it's just because of the vantage point that I hold, which is I see all these people who would never meet each other in their normal lives coming out here. I think that like if we could, it's not a writing retreat, but if you could capture that in your life, friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, and maybe not hold it in your home, but someplace, you know, grab an Airbnb. Again, all of this is sort of um, tiptoeing into this conversation because of the, of the pandemic. But wouldn't that be incredible to do this thing and then you decide your own rules. You figure out how you want to tell your stories. You create the safe space. I, I want that to happen. I want, I, I know that it needs to happen. So Laura, what next? What now? That's the question of the book I'm asking you. What now? Well, yeah. uh, it's like all of us. Hi, Kaylee. Um, and thank you again. Support your local bookstores. Please support Bank Square. We'll do that in a minute. Um, for me, I, um, yeah, like everybody else, I've been pivoting. So I just finished an eight week online course called Haven Home. Um, I am um, also starting something called Haven Nest, which is an online monthly subscription community, 19 bucks a month, but you have to have done one of my Haven things just because again, trying to make it safe, making sure it's safe. Every single Friday, I do something called So Now What Journaling. I've been doing it for free for a year. Um, with the exception of Christmas and two other times, because I think that all of us need to give whatever gift we have out into the world. Um, so if you wanna do that, I can put the link down in the chat. Uh, that might take me a second to do that, but I think I can probably pull that off and let, oh yeah, I think I can do that. And, um, and then also I'm doing my retreats again and they're almost all full it's so funny like people are it's not funny it's just like people are going to be flocking to these sorts of gatherings so i feel safe doing it in the fall i've got two in september and one in october and let me get the zoom link um how about you deborah how can we support you and your beautiful book well i have a book coming out in a month i'm very excited to i'm doing some Zoom events that are sort of segueing into live going into fall. I'm gonna hit the road a little bit. I'm from the Midwest. So I'm driving to you know Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, Indianapolis, Cincinnati. And uh, <laughs> I might actually drive. I have this idea that I might get in my car. So that's, that's now what, what now for me, and I'm editing a third book and you know, doing that navigating dance, for me, I've been more of a sequential adult than a simultaneous adult. I didn't always find the time to write 
while I was raising my children. It was a much more minor activity. So um, I'm enjoying this period where it is the major activity. I didn't know you were a Midwesterner. You know, we both are Midwesterners. Okay. It's right. My link is in, okay, to panelists and all attendees for So Now What Journaling. It's free, do it. You know what, I'll, I'll tell you, we Midwesterners, uh, people show up at those events and like the, I, I did, a, I, I rented a car and drove all over the Midwest uh, 10 years ago with This Is Not The Story You Think It Is. And I mean, it was slammed. People show up for those. It's much more than LA and New York. So, um, um, but also Connecticut, we have to always remember our bank square and Savoy. Um, but I, I'm excited. And listen, you guys, I, I, I sat there for a day. Again, it's going to be a much more beautiful book. This is the advanced reading copy. And I just devoured this thing because it, it, it does read a lot like um, Rebecca, which is like my favorite book, when, you know, and um, I just, I loved every minute of it. So I hope you guys will support um, Deborah as well. Thank well, thank you, Laura. This has been an absolute delight. You're a delight. This has been wonderful. Well, why don't you just come out to Montana and we can hang out on my front porch and talk about life. I may do that. I may come to one of these retreats. They sound just fantastic. Drive, just drive. If you're driving through the Midwest, just keep driving. Just keep going west. And I've got a nice front door. We can be social distanced. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you all so much for all of our um, attendees tonight and to our panelists. Um, Laura Munson, author of This Is Not the Story You Think It Is, A Story of Unlikely Happiness. And tonight's focus now out in paperback, Willis Grove, the link is in there. And of course, Deborah Goodrich Royce, also in conversation tonight and our wonderful moderator, uh, Finding Mrs. Ford. And as uh, Laura just showed her upcoming publication, Ruby Falls. Thank you all for your support tonight. Um, and thank you to our wonderful panelists for your amazing conversation and just two inspiring women who um, it was amazing to listen to you discuss and we so appreciate having you here. So I hope you all have a great night and get to check out those links. Um, but thank you both so much. Thank you, Kaylee. A thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Kaylee. Good night, everyone. Thank you all. Bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night.